so much for the kind introduction and I hope uh, I'm sure that you'll have a, a nice afternoon at least from the Central European perspective on, 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 on time. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you today's uh, uh, lecture. It is uh, Professor Ibrahim Osturk uh, from University um, of uh, Duisburg. He's in um, well, he will speak about the intersection between populism and in economy in the in the broader sense, but he is an expert in uh, development, institutional, international economics and governments with uh, uh, research uh, 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 in um, uh, three specific countries, uh, Japanese, uh, China and Turkey. And I think this um, involvement of um, in between or hybrid regimes and intersection with a uh, between populism in those countries with uh, democratic decline would also be an uh, interesting point for all of you studying um, uh, populism and the conflicts, as I realized during this uh, introductory uh, uh, section. Between, before the, the current appointment at the University of Duisburg, uh, Professor Osterk was uh, working in a number of universities, uh, University of Marmara, Bosphorus University, University of Tokyo, Institute of Development uh, Economies also in Japan and North American University in Texas. He is also a blog writer, he is TV commentator, you can find a number of recordings uh, uh, on, on the YouTube and I will not delay uh, the beginning of the lecture anymore. Uh, Ibrahim, the, the floor is yours and I will be back uh, roughly in 40 minutes to moderate uh, the, the discussion and Q&A session. Thank you very much, Dr. Dushan, for uh, that uh, kind introduction. So let me start my uh, presentation after sharing the screen without losing more time. So this is a nice view from my uh, country of Japan <laughs> with a background picture of Fujiyama. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we have to shift into my presentation from that beautiful view. Uh, let me start by. Uh... So, uh, is there any problem in my screen? Do you see the presentation? No, yeah, so good we, see. we see. Yeah, if you yes, can no make problem. it full screen. Fine. Fine. Yeah, thank okay. you. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I will do it for in uh, full screen after starting uh, my presentation. Uh, welcome to uh, my presentation uh, today. Uh, uh, I will start uh, talk uh, by the definition of uh, populism. Uh, I afraid uh, this part of my presentation presentation will overlap with uh, the former presentations. But uh, for that reason, I will try to keep my uh, this part uh, very briefly. Uh, but I have to use those conceptualization in the rest of my paper. Uh, after uh, focusing uh, briefly on the stylized facts on populism and the demand and supply conditions of uh, populism globally, and then I will shift on the macroeconomics of populism under the title of response. Uh, and uh, I will also talk about its results. But in terms of results, I will uh, uh, focus on uh, the institutional destruction of populism and its result in the form of middle income trap in uh, emerging market economies. And then we will open a discussion according to the program. Thank you so uh, much. If you could make it full screen, please. Thanks. Oh. What happened here? Perfect, thanks. Okay, so uh, as you all know, populism is an, is an anti-establishment rhetoric which divides society into uh, two antagonistic groups between the people and the elite. Uh, elite represents the establishment and uh, rich uh, companies, uh, capital owners, People are the citizens or uh, the big silent majority. Uh, the big uh, danger is here, uh, the, uh, the people are assumed to be homogeneous. So it ignores class division. There is no class in the society. And it uh, implies that uh, the interests of people are in harmony. 
So the one uh, homogeneous group and uh, the, their interest is in harmony. So it has two, uh, this perspective, this uh, division and uh, such perception of the citizen homogeneous and with harmonious interest uh, uh, might come with two uh, crucial implication. One implication is that political power should be taken away from economic, financial, intellectuals or the establishment owners uh, from political elites, etc., uh, uh, in favor of uh, the people. So uh, a regime should be established, which is controlled by the people. The second uh, implication is that in the name of people, a cult of charismatic leaders uh, are needed. Uh, the, the, such a charismatic leader uh, captures uh, who captures power, uh, assumed to represent people's actual interest, their voice, and uh, serve them. Uh, so, uh, however, uh, there is a very big fundamental problem with such an electoral majoritarian approach. Uh, populists come to power by dividing and fragmentation, as many underline. Uh, populists try to stay in power by destroying and transforming the system gradually. And ultimate uh, destination is, of course, absolutist uh, uh, governance. However, the main reason is the, the rejection of the accepted governance norms, namely accepting uh, common to power through popular vote, but rule with rules and institutions. They reject it. They accept uh, the the rule of the game by uh, incoming to power through a vote by they reject the rule with rules and institution. Uh, I think uh, this will uh, create the main uh, problem for us. So when they are in opposition, let me uh, very briefly summarize uh, overall characteristics of uh, uh, populist approach. When they are in opposition, uh, uh, populists uh, uh, benefit from a very much oversimplified and non-tested simplistic solutions to society's problems. They also exploit nostalgia, history, religion, nationalism to construct a populist heartland corresponding to retrospectively constructed utopia based on an abundant but indeed undead past or, or never happened uh, such a past, but it is reimagined, recreated on the desire and imagination of a people. But when they come in power, uh, they immediately invent an enemy uh, to cement their power. They also reject compromise by dismantling the checks and balances between legislature, executive, and judiciary. And thirdly, uh, they discredit and deny uh, science, scientists, professional expertise, division of labor, and autonomous institutions of the uh, uh, both economic and political system, such as uh, the central bank, uh, statistical institute, uh, uh, regulation authorities, uh, competition board, uh, banking uh, uh, oversee uh, uh, organizations, and so forth. And they also manipulate scientific data, as we have witnessed during the pandemics. Uh, there are almost five uh, empirical uh, observations on uh, populist governance uh, globally. The first important observation is that we are passing through a populist era right now. It is all time high as of 2018, following a 30 year secular trend increase, uh, but uh, it started exploding, especially after the global economic crisis in 2007 and, and uh, eight and nine. The second observation is that populism has a serial characteristics. The existing of a former populist prepares the ground for new one, such as in Italy, Mexico, and right now in Turkey. The third uh, stylized uh, fact uh, is that populists come in the aftermath of a macroeconomic crisis or a recession. Uh, so this is the main trigger of uh, their coming into the power. Fourth, they serve in office and shape their country's political fate for a decade or more. On average, according to the rec uh, recent researches, 
the number of years in power of populists is twice as high as non-populist uh, governments. So uh, for regular uh, governments, uh, the, uh, the duration is four years, one term. But uh, in case of uh, populist governments, it is two, twice more, uh, eight years and more. Uh, so that means they somehow manage to stay longer in uh, the government, uh, in the power. The fifth and uh, last observation is that only few populists regularly exit, uh, for instance, by being elected out, out of power through a regular election. The modes of departure, however, often in involve scandals, impeachment or resignations, constitutional crisis, refusals to step down, as happened in uh, Brazil in the last election, and in uh, the United States uh, in 2018, when Trump uh, resisted uh, the outcome. And also, uh, there might be some uh, military coups, suicides, or deadly accidents to let them go from the power. So they come through the uh, peaceful methods uh, by accepting the rule of the system. Unfortunately, after remaining in power more than enough, after transforming the system, they create the needed tools to resist of going uh, from the government. So this is uh, I, uh, my uh, some selected countries uh, which are known as uh, populist governments, uh, which are known to be ruled by populist politicians: Turkey, Nigeria, Mexico, sometimes uh, Russia. Uh, uh, China, Indonesia, Brazil, India, Argentina, and South Africa. Uh, so they are ordered in my table according to their uh, record in the uh, World Justice Order uh, uh, Rule of Law Index in 2020. As you see, uh, Turkey's uh, score is the lowest one. And uh, also uh, per capita GDP in those uh, uh, populist countries are, uh, uh, overall speaking, lower than the world average. So in terms of economic performance, their performance in terms of per capita GDP is not sufficient. Uh, in terms of uh, rule of law index, uh, their situation is uh, quite uh, uh, lower. Uh, their characteristics are populist, authoritarian in Russia in, in Russia and China. The, process has already completed, but other populist countries are potential candidates to become also oppressive authoritarian regimes. But all those countries are uh, classified in the Freedom House Index as not free or partly free. So you see pop there is a, a close linkages between populism, low level of per capita GDP, and Freedom Index. Uh, so uh, the uh, parameters are quite uh, uh, mutually supportive. So let's uh, say the root cause of populism uh, in terms of demand and supply conditions. Uh, most of the time, four factors are mentioned. Cal cultural factors are definitely important. Uh, in, For instance, in the United Kingdom, uh, the level of general unemployment is quite lower. Uh, the country is rich. Uh, 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 many uh, European countries, such as uh, Germany, is also rich uh, without uh, significant rate of unemployment. But uh, the right-wing populism is on the rise because of uh, cultural factors, protecting identity, status, lifestyle, indigenous culture, etc. Uh, the second uh, trigger is the failure to adapt to the speed of change and uncertainty generated by globalization and digitalization in the world. So societies uh, cannot move uh, faster, but uh, unfortunately, because of technolo technological shifts uh, and revolutions, uh, uh, people cannot keep pace with those changes. The third trigger is uh, definitely direct economic threats, such as low growth, rising unemployment, low income, inequality, stagnation of wages, uh, plus lower education, high a a aging problem in the societies. And finally, uh, the failure to manage the transition to higher welfare globally and locally, 
I think the, I will uh, focus on the last one because uh, it is the meaning of uh, middle income trap, which is the declaration of failure indeed. Uh, yes, we as a country, we fail to manage, we fail to adapt to the given global circumstances uh, through uh, succeeding in the required reform and uh, transformation of the system. So, uh, uh, in the uh, two coming uh, slides, I will try to uh, uh, create a transmission mechanism uh, linking uh, populism to the global uh, challenges. Oh, as you know, uh, we are not going to talk about, discuss it, but uh, there is uh, the Western biased multilateralism is already ended. Uh, it cannot solve global problems anymore. It is not uh, accepted as a multilateral approach anymore. So it, uh, I think uh, we need uh, the reconstruction of multilateralism globally. Uh, the second, uh, uh, of course, uh, that multilateralism is increasingly replied replaced by the rising multiplex world, uh, which means uh, we are witnessing the rise of uh, world of multipolarity, uh, but uh, we have a paradox of uh, power transition uh, in a world where there is uh, neither a bipolar structure nor a genuine multipolar structure. Uh, we cannot uh, create a common denominator. We cannot uh, to cooperate uh, in addressing global challenges. Uh, there, there is also multiplication, uh, regionalization, and internalization of several uh, problems with originally local characteristics, but they can easily go beyond uh, national borders, such as uh, the pandemic uh, and uh, the financial contagion after the global uh, financial crisis in 2008 and 9. So they might be uh, locally originated, but they have uh, global characteristics. And in the existence of uh, weak multilateralism and uh, under the rise of multiplex world, uh, we cannot address those uh, uh, problems with global characteristics properly. There are also people who feel that they are abandoned, who feel they are forgotten in different sectors, regions of the world. And this feeling of frustration, uh, feeling of uh, being abandoned is create, uh, creating frustration and uh, they are motivated to uh, uh, seek a solution from some sort of uh, heterodox approaches, let me say, in economics. And finally, of course, legitimacy crisis is an important trigger of populism, loss of trust in governments, political establishments, and international organizations. People are looking for different voices. Uh, to be more precise, indeed, uh, regarding all those things, uh, globalization and global governance uh, is seen as a constraint on the sovereignty and independence uh, and independent decision making of the nation states. So people start to think that they cannot solve their problem because they are not eligible to make uh, independent decisions making because of uh, the pressure from international organizations, from multi multinational companies, etc. Uh, the contagion of uh, economic crisis, financial crisis is also very well known and felt by people. Free trade also is seen as a, a source of problem because uh, people are increasingly believing that uh, free trade is benefiting people, generally working in modern rising export-oriented industries, but uh, those people who are employed in lower value added industries, which are domestic oriented, uh, if they are not properly protected, uh, those people either are going to lose their job or they will be taken under pressure to accept a lower wage. Therefore, free trade is also creating a sort of uh, demand for, uh, let's say, heterodox approaches uh, for uh, protectionism. Uh, as it is causing job and income loss. Uh, and uh, also uh, migration, uh, as you, we all know, is creating demand for uh, populist governments, populist uh, politics. So as a response to all those uh, problems, uh, as you know, populism 
journalists uh, usually uh, accuse, uh, blame uh, national global elites, financial capital, multinational companies, international organizations such as the United Nations, IMF, World Bank, World Trade Organization, and the European Union, international media, even some expatriates like George Soros, who passed away a couple of months ago. But uh, many people in different countries believe that a couple of uh, those kind of rich capitalists can change the fate of their countries in a negative direction. Uh, and therefore, people start to believe that national strategies are superior than global and European uh, uh, pol politics because global and European policy uh, are uh, working in the interest of uh, big companies, multinational companies, capital owners, not in favor of ordinary people. Uh, uh, also, uh, un unsustainable redistribution through a mechanism like price controls, consumption subsidies, inflation, exchange rate, overvaluation or devaluation. These are uh, the uh, varieties of response uh, that populist government uh, implement at the beginning of their government to improve income distribution. Uh, but uh, the result of this story will be uh, different, as we will see later. And the need for reform and transformation in the long run is sacrificed, unfortunately. So they adopt a short-term oriented policy perspective against the long run oriented reform perspective. Policies, short-term policies bring rewards, but long-term oriented reforms start with the cost. Therefore, populist governments cannot start with the risk of implementing long-term oriented reforms. So uh, this is from uh, uh, Dornbusch and Edwards uh, research on Latin American countries. Indeed, uh, uh, pop the economics of populism started with uh, the macroeconomic analysis of Latin American countries at the beginning of 1990s, when one after another, all countries went into economic crisis. At that time, Dormush and Edwards uh, decided to make a systemic analysis of those countries. And for the first time in the history, they called those policies as populist economic policies. After that, uh, there is not so much research on the macroeconomics of populism indeed. So they uh, underlined that macroeconomics is a short-term oriented approach. It provides faster, simplistic, however, unsustainable policies. During a crisis, especially populist uh, diverts resources from uh, policy, policy priorities, from priority areas to short-term uh, areas which would increase the pleasure of the voters. And also they implement ad hoc policy uh, uh, by ignoring intertemporal budget constraint and capacity limitations. These are important because uh, in order to remain in the power, they uh, implement uh, expansionary budget uh, policies. Uh, they print too much money. Uh, they uh, uh, follow expansionary fiscal policies. And they believe that uh, when they implement uh, deficit-oriented policies to increase the satisfaction of the society, uh, in the next term, term uh, in a well-working uh, economic system, by collecting more and more taxes, uh, they will be able to close the budget deficit. But it, it doesn't happen, indeed. It doesn't happen. Uh, when you create a budget deficit, you trigger accumulation of uh, national debt. Uh, after a while, you lose control on budget deficit as well as on the accumulating national debt. Uh, that means they, uh, 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 with a short-lived self-defeating boom, uh, populist uh, macroeconomics has no feature. So, uh, uh, for instance, let me uh, share with you uh, a couple of important empirical evidence on the results of uh, populist macroeconomic uh, policy. Uh, first of all, uh, under populist governance, economic growth goes beyond potential level. Uh, so in any countries, uh, 
uh, either you increase potential growth level through reform, institutional reforms, uh, and achieve a, a sustainable high growth, and therefore you can increase per capita GDP in a sustainable way, or without uh, undertaking all those painful, costly reforms, you push the economy beyond potential growth level through expansionary fiscal and monetary policies, and the result will be stagnation and inflation, either stagnation or inflation, sometimes at the combination of both, which is called stagflation, nowadays happening in Turkey and some other countries. The coexistence of stagflation, inflation plus uh, uh, stagnation, low economic growth is, the, as you know, is the most dangerous economic outcome, which might happen uh, quite regularly in populist economic uh, countries. Uh, the second important uh, observation in the long term is the Schutark decline in per capita GDP. Over 15 years, GDP per capita and consumption declined by more than 10% compared to a hypothetical non-populist counterfactual, according to several researchers. For instance, it happened in Turkey in 2012, per capita GDP declined from 12,500 to $8,000 in 2012. So a, a really sharp decline in per capita GDP. The same happened in Brazil. Uh, in 2010, uh, Da Silva Lula uh, left the government. Uh, in 2018, uh, strong right-wing populist uh, Bolsonaro came into power. And during Bolsonaro uh, period, uh, per capita GDP continued declining again. So uh, the third important uh, implication is re related with income distribution. As you know, they come to power by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, promising that they will improve income distribution when they, when they come to power because they are going to represent uh, people who are homogeneous and whose interests are in harmony, not in conflict. And there is no class division there. So rather uh, the contrary, uh, uh, they uh, rather destroy income distribution. At the beginning, through unsustainable policies, they, there might be some uh, temporary improvement in income distribution, but at the end of, towards the end of their period, we see that income distribution uh, becomes more and more uh, worsely uh, uh, distributed. And finally, uh, they trigger also economic nationalism. Economic nationalism doesn't uh, work uh, in this age because uh, in order to protect local work, local job, local sectors, uh, there might be a high level of uh, uh, tax tariff uh, imposition, but it, it results in a high cost of uh, production, high cost of life also. So this is uh, uh, the story of per capita GDP in selected populist countries. I give only Turkey, Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico here. As you see, starting as of uh, 2012, uh, in many countries, in Turkey, in Mexico, in Brazil, in uh, also Argentina, there has been sharp decline in per capita GDP in all those countries. And here we see the arrival of pandemics. And uh, here we see uh, the process of recovery somehow. We don't know what might happen. But the obvious fact is that under the populist governments, we see a regular decline in per capita GDP, which is against their promises at the beginning. So let me come to the last part of my uh, speech. Uh, how much time do I have right now? Uh, it it would be nice if you can wrap up. Yeah, thank you so much. Like five minutes. Sorry? If if you can wrap up in like five minutes, it would be wonderful. Oh, diff very difficult, but I'll try my best. Thank so, you. Uh, you. You see, uh, institutions are very important. I have to uh, emphasize uh, main aspects. Institutions are the rule of the game. Uh, so through these uh, uh, rules, we can maximize uncertainty. We can maximize transaction cost uh, in economics, and we can increase efficiency thanks to those rule of 
the game. Uh, when we say uh, the rule of the game, for instance, we imply secure property rights for effective con contract enforcement, uh, patent protection, uh, to solve uh, collective action problems by eliminating asymmetric information between principals and agents. Uh, I, since I don't have time, I cannot uh, clarify them so much, but depending on the questions, we can go over them again. So uh, rules prevent contingency, discretionary or arbitrary management of the governments, which is completely against the psychology of populist politicians. And uh, so when uh, there is uh, rules, when there is no uncertainty, uh, and when people are motivated to participate in economic activities, uh, we can uh, ease cooperation by providing public services for a level playing field. Uh, and also uh, institution, institutions provide us maximum information for rational decision making through transparency, accountability, uh, scientific management, uh, many uh, institutions, organizations uh, regularly provide us good information. Information is the basis of rational economic management in economics. If there is no reliable, correct uh, information provided by uh, autonomous institutions, and if there is no rule-based, uh, transparent uh, uh, regulate, regulation activities, we cannot uh, uh, create, uh, we cannot take reliable decision economics. And also institutions uh, uh, foster talent, skills, and increase our choices. Uh, so, uh, in, uh, so the, the, to summarize, uh, we have some advantages of uh, democracies, uh, which comes uh, with institutions. Uh, institutions for participation, compromise, bargaining, cooperation, check and balance, and legal protection are the sources of long-term oriented economic growth. They bring innovation, economies of scale, education, and capital accumulation in the long term, given those institutional uh, infrastructure of the economy. However, populists undermine them, uh, and uh, because they, they, uh, under the populist pressure, there will be failure to create reform coalitions for collective action, uh, because populism based on division, not un unification of the nation. Therefore, uh, uh, harsh, hard reforms, costly reforms, painful reforms require really cooperation. Uh, uh, they require really bargaining, but uh, under the divisive approaches of a uh, populist government, we cannot solve that uh, collective action problem. Uh, and also uh, there will be uh, complicated uh, surrounding so that uh, we will not graduate uh, from low value added industries to upper value added industries through complex product value chain uh, uh, reformation. Uh, so that means under populist government, uh, classical industries will survive. Low value added, uh, isolated, protectionist oriented, uh, traditional sectors will survive. And finally, of course, uh, in, under the uh, lack, lack of uh, compromise uh, and uh, long-term uh, reform, a potential growth level will not improve. Uh, therefore, uh, populist uh, uh, policies will not uh, survive in the long term. Let me stop at this uh, stage uh, be, be, because it is not uh, easier to uh, complete uh, all material. I hope there might be some uh, questions uh, so that we can return back to my presentation and discuss them a little bit further. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, probably we can start with the Q and A. Q &A. So um, yeah, we can we can leave the presentation on. Uh, so I'm inviting participants to uh, raise hands and um, initiate the, the the first round of discussions. Perhaps we can pick up a few questions for the first round and then uh start making uh, kind of circles 